Um, so it's fun to be the very last talk of the conference. Uh, it's been wonderful to attend a theory conference as well. My name is Mernush Tahani. I'm a Banting Fellow sponsored by the Government of Canada. I've taken Banting to Stanford, so that's where I'm located. But the uh, research that I'm presenting today is the work that I did while I was at the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory in Canada with the National Research Council of Canada, or NRC. So in the past few days, we've been hearing some terms over and over again. I've listed some that are important for the research that I'm presenting today. So I'm talking about three-dimensional magnetic fields. This is an observation talk and a magnetic field talk. So I'll first start by talking about what the one-dimensional and two-dimensional of my magnetic field observations in the past decade have been telling us. And I'll discuss why we need three-dimensional magnetic field observations and the techniques that they've developed to reconstruct the complete 3D magnetic fields. And then I'll discuss what are the, some of the astrophysical insights that we can gain from these 3D observations. <coughs> So one thing I like to also emphasize is that when I say 3D, I mean in position, 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 space, so including their direction, so real 3D. So I'd like to start by a summary slide that I presented in the Protostar and Planet 7 meeting, summarizing the chapter that we wrote to summarize the progress in the last decade on magnetic field observations. And that is on the cloud scale and the scales uh, of large molecular cloud, giant molecular cloud, or molecular cloud, and then filaments within these clouds. So what observations have shown is that we see statistically magnetic fields tend to be parallel to low density structures and perpendicular to high density structures in the cloud scale. When we go to lower uh, scale, like lower, uh, smaller scales, and the scales of filaments within molecular clouds that are forming stars, what we see again statistically is that magnetic fields tend to be parallel to low density structures and perpendicular to higher density structure. But at that scale, we also see another transition back to parallel. Uh, which is when the gravity dominates the system and it pulls the magnetic field along itself, along the filaments. I won't talk about the core scales, but I've left it there just in case. And in terms of energy balances, what we see is that in the cloud scales, uh, the magnetic fields seem to be dominant. So the systems are subalphanic, and when we look at the mass to flux ratio, which is a term to compare the gravitational energy to magnetic energy, we see that the mass to flux ratio in the cloud scale is less than one. When we go to a smaller scale within the clouds in filaments, we see that the numbers are different. We see regions that magnetic fields are dominant and regions that magnetic fields are not dominant. So we see alpha and mag number less than one. We see subalphanic, transalphanic, and superalphanic systems. And in terms of mass to flux ratio, this is also different. It's changing significantly. So one thing that we tried to address in this chapter was to see whether the transition from parallel to perpendicular is related to the transition from subalphanic to superalphanic systems. And we did not find any links. Uh, but that does not mean that, that there isn't any link. Uh, we need a lot more observations and, of course, a lot more simulation. So that's one thing I like the simulators, to invite the simulators in the room to investigate as well, whether there is a transition, when, whether there is a link between the transition from parallel to perpendicular and alpha and Mach number. So these uh, studies and estimates are based on the Davis Chandrasekhar Fermi observations, estimates of magnetic fields using dust polarization. And as we heard from Dimitri and Mordecai on Tuesday, there are concerns for the DCF estimates. So one of the 
um, topics that we tried to also focus on in this chapter was to see how well the DCF estimates follow the Zeeman estimates. So Kate Patel compiled all the DCF measurements since the publication of Ostriker et al., Padon et al., Heitsch et al., 2001, and we compared them statistically with Zeeman observations. So we, uh, we specifically looked at the density magnetic relation that was first observed using Zeeman measurements uh, by Crusher. So here, this plot, the red is showing the power law uh, relation proposed by Crusher. Blue shows Zeeman observations and black shows the DCF estimates. And what is striking is that the DCF and Zeeman estimates actually follow the same trend. But what is important to note is that the DCF estimates magnetic fields overestimate the magnetic fields three to five times compared to what we would expect to get from Zeeman observations. So all these often Mach number and mass to flux ratios that I mentioned are with large uncertainties, large error bars, and that has something that people have, we, we are working on to improve all these techniques to have better estimates of energy balances. All right, so because of this, one of the main um, parameters or, or uh, factors that I try to focus on in my research to investigate which mechanism is, dominate, is dominating the system is by looking at the magnetic field geometries. And these observations that I mentioned so far are one-dimensional and two-dimensional magnetic field observations, but we need 3D. That's because if we have a cloud or a molecular cloud and the magnetic field is oriented perpendicular to that cloud, we have a line of sight component that is uh, parallel to the line of sight and a plane of sky component. And when projected onto the plane of the sky, that can look parallel. So we need techniques to uh, determine the 3D magnetic fields. So let's start by looking at the common techniques of observing magnetic fields. So one technique is dust polarization, which is based on the alignment of elongated interstellar dust grains perpendicular to magnetic fields. And this technique provides the plane of sky component of magnetic field. And there has been lots of different observations and mission to probe the plane of sky component of magnetic field using this technique. Uh, in different regions, both diffuse and molecular regions. Zeeman uh, squeezing is another technique that provides the line of sight component of magnetic field, and it actually probes both diffuse and molecular regions, but the technique needs long telescope integration time and strong magnetic field, so there are not enough Zeeman measurements available. Faraday rotation is another technique that provides the line of sight component of magnetic field, and it's the rotation of a linearly polarized electromagnetic wave in a magneto-ionic medium. Um, so the amount of rotation is given by this formula where lambda is the wavelength, B is the magnetic field, DL is the path length, and NE is the electron volume density. And the rotation, the Quantity in parentheses is known as rotation measure. So when I say RM, I mean rotation measure. And there are uh, three main techniques that can use Faraday rotation to probe the line of sight component of magnetic fields in uh, different regions. So one is the classical technique of using extra galactic point sources. So these are uh, radio galaxies or quasars. And so they produce a linearly polarized electromagnetic wave. And the region that is um, the magnetoionic region for us is the galaxy. And it has been traditionally used to probe the large scale galactic magnetic fields and magnetic fields of highly ionized regions. Another technique is Faraday tomography, which instead of relying on point sources, relies on 
extended emission. And what it does is actually decomposes polarized intensity into components of rotation measure along the line of sight. So the technique is very powerful and relatively new. Uh, there are different groups working on the technique to improve the technique further as well. And it has been applied to various regions, including cosmic filaments and also in uh, work with Larry Rudnick, we applied it to jets and radio galaxies. So for molecular clouds, um, I developed a technique um, based on, again, point sources, so extragalactic sources or pulsars to uh, determine the line of sight component of magnetic field associated with molecular clouds. And the technique uses an on-off measurement uh, to find the direction of magnetic field and column density observations or um, extinction observations uh, along with a chemical evolution code. So any chemical evolution code can be used. So the code that we developed with my NRC students is available on GitHub. There's another version which is private and we will make it available soon. But the results that I got from this technique was that whenever we had nearby molecular Zeeman measurements, our results was consistent with, in terms of strength and direction with Zeeman measurements. And when we compare it with atomic um, Zeeman measurements, it's consistent in a direction with atomic Zeeman measurements. So here I'm showing the Orion A molecular cloud, which is a nearby molecular cloud. And what we see is that, uh, so here red shows magnetic field away from you, blue shows magnetic field toward you. And we see that at one side, magnetic field is predominantly pointing away. At the other side of the cloud, magnetic fields are pointing toward you. So this magnetic field reversal was previously observed using atomic Zeeman observations uh, with, uh, in the same region with the same direction and investigated in some theoretical observations. So this reversal, we see it in the Perseus and California cloud, and also parts, parts of Taurus molecular cloud. And what I like to highlight here as well is that with the upcoming observations by the very large array, square kilometer array, uh, and its pathfinders, these observations will be significantly improved. So we'll have a lot more detection. So to reconstruct 3D magnetic fields, now I use plane of sky Planck observations and my line of sight observations, constructed models that could explain these uh, reversals. And what I found using a Monte Carlo analysis is investigating a, a systematic range of biases and chi-squared probability values was that an arc-shaped magnetic field morphology where the field bends around the filamentary structure is the most probable candidate to explain this reversal. So in the arc-shaped morphology, regardless of how the filamentary structure is formed, the environment is thought to be responsible to be interacting with the field lines and bending them around the filamentary structure. But this arc is, we know it's arc. We don't know the direction or whether it's concave or convex. So what I did next was to use galactic magnetic field uh, models. So I particularly used the model of Janssen and Farrar 2012. Um, and this is to model the ordered component of magnetic field perhaps before the formation of the cloud here and before the evolution of the cloud. And here I'm showing Perseus instead of Orion A. We see the same reversal in Perseus. This Perseus is slightly easier to talk about. And again, the plane of the drapery lines show the plane of sky magnetic fields. Red show magnetic field away from you. Blue shows magnetic field pointing toward you. And uh, so with my NRC student, Jennifer Glover, and Wednesday Lukipchu, we reconstructed the complete 3D magnetic field morphology this time. 
Um, so the, minus, the galactic magnetic field morphology, I forgot to put it here, it points in this direction. And um, so it's this, this red vector is the galactic magnetic field morphology. And the field morphology that we reconstructed after the formation, definitely evolution of the cloud, is concave from our point of view and points in the decreasing galactic long, uh, longitude direction. So this R-shaped morphology has been actually predicted in some MHD simulations, particularly uh, the cloud formation model of Inuxica et al. 2015, um, where multi-compressions are needed to form clouds. So what I did was to look at velocity here and make predictions, so CO and H1 velocity, and make predictions of the cloud magnetic field morphology, and that was based on this cloud formation model, and that was uh, consistent with uh, the field morphology that we reconstructed. So then I looked at whether there are bubbles in this uh, region, and so there is the famous pair OB2 association, initially identified by John Bally, and then the pair tau, uh, most recently identified in 3D dust maps. And so Perseus is located behind from our point of view, and multiple supernovae has resulted in the formation of this super bubble. And calculating the magnetic pressure and often Mach number, we estimated that magnetic field is, is strong enough to retain a memory of the initial galactic magnetic field. So the galactic magnetic field, as a result of this supernova, has been just bent. And this is something that has been seen in simulations, different simulations, and also observationally seen here using synchrotron observations. So now if we use this model uh, and try to explain this uh, 3D magnetic field morphology that we reconstructed, we can say that, okay, so initially we have the galactic magnetic field uh, model. Then as a result of uh, interaction by the super bubble, we have the bending of magnetic field. But this bending that actually doesn't observe, the, doesn't explain the line of sight magnetic field reversal that is directly associated with the Perseus cloud and Orion cloud. So what I proposed next was that there must be another structure perhaps behind the cloud that has interacted with the field lines and with the cloud and has further bent the magnetic field lines. We don't know what structure it is. Um, we're carrying out further observation and studies to figure out what structure this is. But if you assume it's a bubble, it might be something like this. Uh, so it has uh, interacted perhaps from behind the cloud here. And after we put this paper uh, on archive, Marina Conkel using kinematic observations actually confirmed that there must be another structure behind the Perseus cloud. So using 3D magnetic field morphologies, we're explaining how these clouds are formed and we're identifying structures that weren't identified before. So now, this is ordered component of magnetic field. What if we go deeper into the cloud and start to observe fluctuations in, in the cloud? So I'm showing NGC 6334 uh, oh, NGC molecular cloud um, that we observed using James Clerk Maxwell telescope. And so the gray shows the cloud, the uh, orange lines show the plane of sky magnetic fields. And we're seeing a lot of fluctuations, so we were wondering what these fluctuations are. And actually the Planck observations suggest that magnetic fields should be perpendicular to the cloud as uh, statistically it's been observed. But in smaller scales, these are all the fluctuations that we see. But when we look at the star formation activity here, it seems that we can actually easily explain all these fluctuations based on, relatively easily, based on the star formation activity. So here, for example, there is an H2 region uh, 
as a result of the star formation activity here. And it seems that again, in a somewhat self-similar behavior, the magnetic fields are oriented tangent to the bubble. Um, so this fluctuation from the large scale magnetic field is explained by the bubble morphology here. Um, and when we look at the cloud, actually the cloud is covered by H2 regions. Um, so, uh, and the, these H2 regions are at the same distance to the cloud. So when we characterize and uh, quantify the magnetic field morphology here uh, in this work, we found that these bubbles have all pushed the magnetic field to orient them tangential to the um, surface of the bubble, except the very dense region of the cloud where the gravity is dominating. So going from a large scale, we, we have the ordered uh, component of magnetic field as a result of the galactic magnetic field, then by uh, interaction by super bubbles, we have bending, and then interaction by other structure, we have further bending of the uh, magnetic fields. And then when tr we try to look deeper and see, explain uh, the small scale magnetic field morphology, they're actually explained by uh, star formation activity here. So um, in summary, I'd like to mention that we need 3D magnetic field observations and we develop techniques to observe magnetic fields associated with molecular clouds. We are exploring more regions and more phases of the ISM particularly. And we, with these 3D magnetic field morphologies, we can explain the cloud formation uh, scenarios in our galaxy. And with the upcoming observations, there are a lot that I've listed here, just the ones that I have collaborations with, will have a much better understanding of the 3D magnetic field uh, in, in the galaxy. And I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, let's start with questions. Dimitri? Um, uh, so when you said about tomography, uh, could you just? Uh, yep. Uh, when you said about tomography, uh, the way you do it, I, I'm just asking. So um, you have some population of stars, and you vary what stars you're using at what distances they are. Uh, so yeah. what I'm uh, referring to in terms of Faraday tomography in this slide is by so we so the observations are done over a long uh, a, a large range of wavelengths yeah. and so when uh, we take these observations so the polarized intensity q u uh, from lambda squared space to Fourier, to oh, okay. the uh, faraday depth or rotation measure space we can look at the spectrum of rotation measure and we can identify uh, how many peaks in Faraday depth or in rotation measure we have. And there are different attempts to link this Faraday depth into to physical depth. Um, and there has been uh, a couple of publications, but this is an ongoing work. Thank right. you. I, I remember my colleagues tried to invert Faraday rotation angle cube 15 years ago, and they did not succeed too well. So it should be interesting what the progress is. Thank you. you? It's not a question, just a comment. A very nice talk, and I think it's very important to see the magnetic field reversal in 3D, three dimensional. I have just one comment is if we, uh, we would like to have the full structure, full picture of magnetic field, 3D magnetic field will also need the information of inclination angle. And I think our recent work has already made it possible to get such information from dust polarization and also spectroscopy observation. So I would like to uh, expect that if we can combine different methods like your method and our method, we can get a better uh, maps of 3D magnetic field. Thank you, great question. Yes, yeah, so uh, only no, one, one thing I'd like to mention is that um, so, only knowing the inclination angle and the line of sight direction and plane of sky orientation doesn't give the 3D magnetic field morphology. 
Um, so we have, for example, here, there are two cases with two different magnetic field, 3D magnetic field morphology. They have the same line of sight, the same uh, plane of sky orientation, um, and the same inclination angle, but they're different. So yes, combination with these techniques with the techniques that provide the inclination angle can improve the complete 3D magnetic field morphology. Yes, I agree. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So I had uh, a quick question, and I'm sorry if I just, yeah, I, I didn't uh, maybe uh, fully grasp it at the time. When you showed the, uh, uh, the sort of map of the magnetic field on the slide where you also compared it to Mark Krumholtz's simulation. Mm -hmm. okay. yes. um, right, yeah, so these thick orange lines came from the Planck data. Oh, right. so, uh, yes, yeah. So these are, uh, so they're approximate, uh, okay. but they're mm -hmm. from Planck observations, and then the small ones are from JCMT. And, and the small ones, those are not the, the sort of the perturbations on t on t with the Planck data subtracted? Those are the full magnetic fields? Exactly, yes, yeah. They're so maybe if you averaged coarse-grained that field, you would get something like the Planck measurements? I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking. That's an interesting point. Yeah, so if, if we subtract one from the other, it would be interesting to see what these tell us. Um, that's, that's a really interesting, yeah, comment. Uh, can yeah. I, yeah, can I ask, uh, so when at the beginning you said the filament, uh, the transition from parallel to perpendicular filament, and you said uh, we need to do this in, I think uh, it should, you mean sonic Mach number, right, not alpha Mach number. So the transition, so, so all I mentioned was uh, about uh, alpha and Mach number. So we were trying to see whether we can find a link between this transition from parallel magnetic field to perpendicular magnetic field morphology, and uh, whether we can win, link this to either mass to, to flux ratio or alpha and Mach number, because this has magnetic field uh, information in, uh, in it compared to non-thermal uh, velocity information. Yes, if you, if you compare this transition to the Zeeman plot, uh, what do you think it happens? Yeah, so uh, that's essentially what, what we were working on. Uh, so for example, uh, one of the important question is that the density at which this uh, break happens as well. Is there a relation between this break to parallel and perpendicular magnetic field? But we need more observations. Okay. Um. okay. Alex, and then James. Uh, I just, uh, uh, if you go to your f first slide where you were sharing uh, the uh, relation between kinetic energy um, uh, ratio kinetic energy and uh, magnetic energy and the uh, alpha and Mach number. Uh, well, uh, um, it's uh, different from uh, in the subalphanic case. Uh, I was uh, talking about this in my talk, and uh, Betty was uh, talking uh, earlier in terms of the compressible turbulence. So uh, I think uh, it will not change uh, whether you alpha and Mark number larger or smaller, but it will change uh, the, um, you know, how much it's, uh, for example, smaller than alpha and Mach number. Uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. So you're uh, suggesting... Alpha and Mach number, you, you see if uh, you uh, have um, this, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, the same um, uh, scaling uh, of, uh, if you have, for example, alphenic uh, turbulence, uh, it's uh, one ratio. But if you uh, have uh, the dominance of uh, the um, uh, kinetic energy in subalphenic turbulence, it's a different ratio. There is uh, just a small um, thing, okay. not a very big. James? Thanks for this really nice talk. Very, very interesting. Um, this regime that you have put forth here is actually quite hard to do in a, a, a turbulent box because if you set a subalphanic 
mean field on the outer scale, then you can measure the alphan alphanic Mach number as a function scale, and it's always subalphanic, always. So I think what you have to do is um, do something similar to what I did, where you kind of have an emergence of subalphanic turbulence on some intermediate scales, and then you have to have a low enough magnetic Prandtl number such that you decay the magnetic field and are left over with kinetic energy on the smaller scales, so you get back to a super alphanic regime. So this would be like low PM, like PM less than one. So what we see observationally is that when, so the clouds are formed, the system is stop alphanic, and then within the cloud, the system becomes uh, super alphanic and in the scales, of course, definitely super alphanic. Right. So this is what we are we see that is happening observationally. Okay. There's some weird resistivity going on or like how does the flux go? I, I think it's because the density increases so that make the in the cloud you said the density increase that change the alpha Mach number because it's not homogeneous medium. So it's I definitely would... not a homogeneous medium for sure. And um, so one thing we like to do, or like the observers like to do, is to compare the observations with simulations in terms of these uh, transitions and the alpha and Mach number or mass to flux ratio number. So if you have something yeah. that we could. Uh, can I just ask one more question about um, the uh, format? James, James may, may I just suggest that there is a discussion coming up? Uh, yeah. So maybe we can first uh, thank Mernish again. Thank you. For that beautiful talk.